Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope I hope you hear us, and uh, we are now starting our second event in the online uh, web lecture series: Mobility Analysis and Planning for Human Scale Cities. Welcome, everyone. The lecture series seeks to answer the question of how to promote human scale, sustainable, and just cities through mobility analysis and transport planning. It features scholars and experts in transport and spatial planning from both Estonia and abroad. And we run the lecture series in a hybrid mode, which means that some students are here in our small seminar room and most of the attendees uh, join us online. The lecture will be recorded and the recording will be available for all who attend uh, online right now, as well as on the lecture uh, series website, transportplanning.ut.ee. And today we are most happy to host here a US speaker program virtual lecture, which is facilitated by the US Embassy in Estonia. Our speaker today is Professor Harlem Miller from the Department of Geography the Ohio State University. Professor Miller is also the director of the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis at Ohio State University. His research focuses on the intersection between geographic information science and transportation science. He is also interested in the social dimensions of transportation and the implications of human mobility and accessibility for sustainable transportation, livable communities and public health. Professor Miller has received numerous awards, including the Edward L. Allman Award for significant contributions to transportation geography from the Association of American Geographers. He has authored or co-authored more than 200 scientific publications. In his US speaker program lecture, Professor Miller will address the transition towards sustainable mobility. The presentation entitled Why is sustainable mobility so hard? Some observations on the path forward uh, will start now. So welcome Harvey, the floor is yours and you're now welcome to share your screen and start the talk. Thank you. Fantastic. OK, well, thank you. Hello, Estonia and people around the world. I want to thank uh, the Mobility Lab at the University of Tartu and also the US Speaker Program of the US Department of State for this opportunity to talk to you today about sustainable mobility, why it's so hard and what I think are some reasonable paths forward to try to get us to more sustainable mobility at all scales from sit from local to uh, global. So let's start off just by you know, being on the same page here about what I mean by sustainability. And our modern conceptualization of sustainability dates from 1987, the so-called Brundtland Report, which was uh, published by the World Commission on Environment Development. And it's part report called Our Common Future. It's, not, it's uh, as I said, it's often called the Brundtland Report after it's, it's uh, chair, Girl Harlem Brundtland from Norway. And she basically in her commission defines sustainable development as a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this is the most common definition of sustainability, a normative concept that captures basic ideas of intra and intergenerational justice. But another outcome from the Brundtland Report was the conceptualization of sustainability as multidimensional. We often think of sustainability as being an environmental thing, making things green, low carbon, you know, minimal input on the environment. But that's only one part of sustainability, one facet. The other two pillars are, are social. We need to have equitable, fair, just, development and also economic. We need it to be uh, efficient. We need it to be uh, to foster innovative cities and regions. This multidimensional nature of sustainability makes it very challenging. So let's talk a bit about mobility and I want to start off my talk with some very good news and the good news is that we live in an era of mobility miracles. We can do 
things in more places at all geographical scales than previous generations would have imagined in her wildest dreams. Two centuries ago, the thought that we could cross the an ocean in five or six hours, that we could travel around the world and come back in a week would have seemed like magical, fantastic thinking. Nowadays, it's something that people do on a regular basis. Uh, people now travel more in a day than their ancestors a few centuries ago used to travel in an entire year. So we really, our mobility technologies have really created this really age of uh, magic when it comes to mobility and transportation. That's the good news. The bad news is that we're paying a very high cost for this mobility era. Our mobility systems are utterly unsustainable. Mobility is a major contributor to climate change. Most, most of the sources of transportation energy are from non-renewable resources. We have poor air quality in cities all around the world. Much of this uh, driven by uh, automobiles and automobile traffic. Many cities are highly congested, costing people many hours you know of 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 their lives you know uh, sometimes many hours of a day but over the course of a year uh you know just taking a lot of time that could have been could be spent on more productive enjoyable and healthy activities our automobile dominated mobility systems are highly inequitable there are millions of people who can't drive they don't have the physical ability they 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 are not old enough or or uh, they're too old to drive also automobiles are extremely expensive for many people they can't they can't afford it and this is not this is becoming worse now with the rise of electric vehicles which are which are quite expensive and technologically intensive uh, mobility has a uh, Poor impacts on health. We basically have engineered a lot of physical activity out of our daily lives, leading to a crisis in obesity and lifestyle diseases in many parts of the world. And safety, uh, mobility, moving, moving around the city, especially by an automobile, or if you're exposed to automobiles, walking or biking is really the most dangerous thing that people do on a daily basis. And we see this crisis around the world. Uh, in the United States, we have 44,000 deaths every year from automobiles and around 2 million hospitalizations. That, that's a leading cause of death along with uh, guns, unfortunately, in the United States and also opioids. But around the world, in the, and especially in the global south, we're seeing mobility, transportation as being a major cause of death uh, um, and rising um, as time goes on. Now this is becoming a crisis because mobility is central to urbanity and the world is experiencing an urban revolution. For most of the history of civilization, very few people lived in what we now would call towns and cities. It's only since the great acceleration of the mid 20th century that urbanization really started to take off. And sometime around 2008, an epic making event occurred. The majority of the world's population lived in urbanized areas for the first time in history. Many urban scholars, such as Mike Batty at University College of London, argue that we will essentially become an entirely urban planet by the end of the century. Now, certainly COVID has changed this a bit, uh, and other pandemics will change cities in the future as well. There is no doubt, but it won't stop the urbanization trend. Cities are too compelling and too magnetic. Human civilization has experienced major pandemics every century. Cholera was endemic in cities until the late 19th century, and yet cities continued to grow. This urbanization trend tells us that urban sustainability is an existential challenge for humanity. We must figure out how to nurture more sustainable urban forms and urban systems. Now, often when I talk about mobility and talk about sustainable mobility, people say, well, we have electric vehicles and we have autonomous vehicles coming. Won't they solve our mobility problems? I would counter argue that EVs and AVs are at best, at best, a partial solution. First of all, they're still vehicles, those turtle, those turtle, they are still automobiles, which means they're highly inefficient in terms of energy and space. That photograph you see on the slide is a very common one. You may have seen it before. It shows how many cars are required to move about of 40 people versus a versus a bus, the amount of space that each takes up. Cars are also highly inefficient when it comes to energy, especially since many vehicles are only single occupancy vehicles. 
if you think about it, what we're doing when, when a person drives a car is we're taking roughly a 200 pound package and wrapping them in a 4,000, 5,000 and a 6,000 uh, with some of the big EVs that are coming out right now, 9,000 pound packages to move them around the city. When a car moves, it's mostly moving itself. It's moving gasoline. It's moving air. It's a person is very far down on the list. Highly, highly inefficient. One of the uh, things that we talk about with uh, autonomous vehicles is that they're going to make our roads safer, but that is really unclear, especially relative to public transit, which is the safest way to move through a city. If we really want to make people safe, we would promote public transit rather than autonomous vehicles. Again, as I mentioned, cars are very inequitable due to their cost. This will become even more of, of a crisis, more of an unjust issue as uh, they become more techno technologically intensive with autonomous vehicles. There'll be a lot like your smartphones where they'll have to be updates on a regular basis. And that will just make the social polarization surrounding mobility even, even more harsh. And also when it comes to autonomous vehicles, it turns out that they may never work. I mean, the last decade we've seen a real retrenchment in the AV industry. It turns out that driving's a hard problem and can't necessarily be solved algorithmically because our human behavior is so complex. What we have to do is really move towards sustainable mobility by moving away from mobility monocultures, which is what you see in many places such as North America, Europe, and increasingly other parts of the world such as China and Southeast Asia. This is one where one mobility option dominates all choices. So there's few mobility options. It's inflexible. People must adapt to the system. Here in America, people plan their entire activity schedules around whether parking's available and whether or not the roads will be congested. And our current infrastructure is saturated. We cannot continue to build our way out of congestion. In fact, because of induced demand, it, it, uh, the, that effect, the more we try to build our way out of congestion, all we do is just generate more congestion. What we have to do is move to mobility polycultures where there's a wide spectrum of integrated mobility options. It's flexible. The system adapts to the pe to people. It's there when it's and there are choices available when you need it for the time, the situation, the, 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 the travel choice. So it's not like we have to plan around transportation. Ra rather, transportation is more like electricity or water. It's something that, that's available. Doesn't mean it's costless. Doesn't mean it won't take time, but it's not something that we have to basically adapt our activities around. And this would be a more effective, sustainable, and resilient system. We know from basic biological and ecosystem science that monocultures are inherently brittle and inherently and can easily collapse while polycultures tend to be more resilient and more adaptive to changing circumstances. So if we know what we want to do, why is this so hard? Why is it so hard to get to sustainable mobility? I mean, much of the science is very clear about what we what we should be doing. Why is it so hard to make this transition? Well, I'm, I'm not going to address in this in this lecture Three reasons. One is sink costs and lock in. The fact that we already have so much infrastructure developed to serve the automobile and to serve those uh, related forms of transportation. And, you know, that we're locked into that system. Also, change is hard for a lot of people, telling people, you know, people are used to living a certain way. People are busy. Some people live paycheck to paycheck. It's difficult to tell people, well, your life is going to totally change. You know, so that's really hard for a lot of people. And some people are very resistant to change. They're very resistant to the unknown. And the political economy of automobility. Uh, people make a lot of money off of automobiles. You know, there's entire industries, the auto industry, construction, real estate, uh, you know, uh, yes, the fossil fuel industry. There's a lot of money around automobile, a lot of profit to be made ar around automobility. So that's going to be something that's difficult to change from because of the political economy surrounding that. These are all really, really important issues and have to be addressed, but I'm not going to talk about that in today's lecture. Instead, I'm going to focus on three things. Mobility is complex, mobility is wicked, and mobility is a dilemma. Let's start with complexity. This is a quote that I really like. It's from an article in Nature called Urban Physics back in 2016, and it's, it just states the problem perfectly. Cities are complicated. 
They comprise large numbers of people and the many ecological, culture, social and economic entities that make up their environment. All of these factors interact in time and space to form complex systems that are constantly evolving in response to changes in climate, environment and people. In this article, Pollock also points out the problem of dealing of uh, obesity and lifestyle diseases in cities and how many interventions that try to uh, reduce this problem can actually lead to, um, you know, these well-intended policy interventions can have ineffectual, uneven and counterintuitive outcomes. So the point of this slide is that is this shows, uh, you know, the, the all the different uh, factors that influence people's level of obesity. It has to do with their commuting behavior, but also their diet, their stress, their, their time, and they spend an exercise. And trying to intervene in one thing, for example, trying to switch our, our mobility systems to encourage more physical activity and active transportation can sometimes have unintended consequences, or it could have, or even just be ineffectual because of the complex interactions of all these feedback loops, both positive and negative. So the point of this slide is that urban phenomena are complex and interventions can often, you know, lead us in different ways. While predicting the future of complex urban systems are possible, is, is impossible, excuse me, it is possible to invent these futures by understanding and shaping the city as an ongoing process. Urban science in the 20th century was dominated by a view of urban systems as a machine, a simple thing composed of causal relationships that could be understood in the aggregate and engineered to receive to achieve a desired equilibrium or steady state. That framework is no longer tenable in the 21st century. The impacts of new transportation and communication technologies are accelerating and amplifying urban dynamics. 21st century cities are complex systems that exhibit intricate feedback loops, path dependency, and emergent behavior. And this limits the power of traditional urban science that use location as a central organizing principle and views the system as evolving towards a steady state or equilibrium. Instead, the new science of cities views urbanity as a multi-level systems and flows and networks that is always in disequilibrium and always evolving. The other part about mobility, another reason why mobility is challenging and sustainable mobility is that mobility is wicked. And I don't mean that mobility is evil. What I mean is the wicked problem. And some of you may have heard of this uh, conceptualization. It dates back to 1973 from Whittle and Weber. And what, what they argue is that many of the problems that we face in society and certainly many of the problems we face in cities are wicked in the sense that they're very difficult problems. The overall goal is ill-defined and malleable and there's conflicting elements and complex interdependencies. We see that with sustainability with its three dimensions and we, could, we, we, should, we need to recognize that there are complex trade-offs among those dimensions, how to measure them, their relative importance and acceptable these trade-offs the ability of these trade-offs are highly contested, reflects personal values, political stances, and perspectives on growth as a problem or as a solution. For example, we could take a strong sustainability view and say that you know we're pessimistic about economic and material growth, we're skeptical of relying upon technological advancement, and what we have to do is make sure that we 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 well we don't we won't accept any trade-offs between human and natural capital and make sure that we're always preserving our natural our natural capital even at the expense of human capital. At the other end of the extreme, there's weak sustainability that reflect that reflects a positive view of growth in technology and views trade-offs among natural and human capital as acceptable and the belief that technology will come along and solve our sustainability problems. And there are there are uh, intermediate stances between between that, that, could, that uh, between those two extreme poles of weak and strong sustainability. But the point here is that these interdependencies and these conflicting elements means that values are integral to our solution to these sustainability problems. Finally, a third challenge is that mobility is a dilemma. What I mean is that mobility is a collective action dilemma. It's individually rational and collectively irrational. It's akin to the tragedy of the commons, the famous uh, metaphor developed by Ger Eric Hardin in, in 1968. The idea that we have a common pool resource that we all share. It's rational for people to use that resource as much as possible on an individual level. But if we all do that, 
the commons fails and uh, we were left with no resource at all. This is what mobility is like. It's rational for individuals to go wherever they want, whenever they want, but the collective outcomes are terrible. The, the unsustainable elements I mentioned earlier in, in my talk. Let's go back to the good news though. We are living in the scientific revolution. We have mo new forms of mobility and urban data. We have appro new approaches to urban experimentation. We have an approach I'll talk about in a few slides called post-normal science, which reboots our view of science when challenging a prob wicked problems such as sustainability and the emerging science of cooperation and collaboration. And this, th these data, these technologies, and these new forms of science can help us push back on mobility being being a being embedded a wicked problem embedded in a complex system, and and fun a, a fundamental dilemma between the, the the wants and needs of the individual and the collective outcomes. So I feel really privileged in my career to have lived through a true scientific revolution, the, the new science of cities. And this is driven by the urban data revolution. Location aware technologies are generating massive geospatial mobility sensor and social data about cities and regions. And this is an opportunity to form a new science of sustainability and of sustainable mobility. From a complex system perspective, perspective, urban processes are a type of experimentation where the, where the system tests, receives feedback, and adapts one small step or one giant leap at a time, depending on the scale. For example, the development of a single property versus a large scale, large scale urban development. That's a natural form of experimentation that happens every day in our cities. There's also purposeful urban experimentation, something called tactical urbanism. This originally emerged from resident led initiatives in cities. Tactical urbanism involves making low cost, provisional and sometimes unsanctioned changes to the built environment, such as chair bombing to create new social spaces, guerrilla gardening and intersection repair to re re refurbishing their sections to slow cars and facilitate walking. Things like pop up bike lanes, pop up bus lanes, things like that that are often driven by, by residents of a city. But more and more urban planners are uh, uh, embracing this perspective as of, of cities as complex systems and are accepting tactical urbanism as a type of bottom-up local adaptation that co-evolves with top-down planning and interventions. And planners increasingly are using tactical urbanism methods to test the impacts of an infrastructural policy change before wider deployments. For example, my city a few years ago, they did a pop-up bus lane in downtown Columbus to see, well, what were the impacts on, uh, on delays in our public transit system, on walkability, bikeability, on traffic and things like that. So they just provisionally put up a, 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 a bus lane in the downtown street just for two weeks and they measured the impacts, took down the bus lane and analyzed that and used that to move forward to another pop-up bus lane in, in another part of the city. And then eventually by bootstrapping this way, one step at a time, they learn how to build a network of dedicated bus lanes. A challenge though is how to integrate these local interventions in coherent understanding and change at the urban scale. Another form of experimentation that we don't often welcome, but are still illuminating are disruptions, things such as infrastructure failures, natural events such as extreme storms, technology changes and pandemics. These reveal the stresses and flaws in our urban systems. And certainly over the last few years with COVID, we've seen a lot of research that treats COVID as a grim but grand natural experiment to understand how big impacts reveal these stresses and flaws in our systems. And we've actually it's actually been very illuminating, particularly with respect to transportation. We saw that COVID had big impacts on traffic. It had big impacts on uh, the amount of crashes we're seeing and injuries. It also is having it's still having big impacts on public transit. And we we don't welcome these events, but when they happen, we use them to try to learn about um, how these complex urban systems evolve. In 2018, a U.S. National Science Foundation recognizes the com recognized the complexity of urban systems and called for a new convergent science of sustainable urban systems that is multi-scale, transdisciplinary, and actively advances science, policy, and community partnerships. 
This report called for the study of urban systems at multiple levels, including sustainability outcomes in the single urban area across multiple cities and communities, and at a global scale to explore interrelationships and identify urban typologies, to understand super aggregation of metropolitan areas and how they interact, and what will be the collective impact of urban transforma transformations on our, uh, on, our, on our sustainability. The new science of sustainable urban systems requires the development of new data and methods to help us understand the interactions among natural, human-built, and social systems that drive sustainability across multiple scales, and the trade-offs among the environmental, economic, and social dimensions of sustainable urban development. This report also call, called for the knowledge for knowledge co-production among researchers, communities, industry groups, and practitioner groups, and governments at all at multiple levels, and to leverage real-world experimentation going on in urban areas in order to understand how urban systems evolve over time. Now, the problem of wicked problems within cities, or the challenge of wicked problems such as sustainability, conservation, climate change has led to some, some the call for a reboot of science, at least science for addressing those type of problems, those, type, those types of imperative problems. The, the problems that, are, that share the double curse of wicked problems embedded within complex systems. So dissatisfaction with the contributions of traditional science to progress on these imperative issues has, has led to this call for or post-normal science. Post-normal science jettisons scientific certainty and value neutral neutrality. So in normal science, we assume that we can predict the future and we assume that our predictions and our and our prescriptions are completely value neutral. When in fact we, we since they're we're dealing with complex systems, we can't really predict the future. And also since we're dealing with wicked problems within complex systems, any solution is going to be value laden. So in this new paradigm of post-normal science, a scientist's role in decision-making shifts from trying to predict the future, or at least decenters that, to giving stakeholders an appreciation of how the future may unfold. This involves understanding the possible future states of the system, the conditions under which these futures may occur, the trade-offs that these different states represent, and the actions that can help adapt, adaptation to these different states, and finally, the degree of confidence in this knowledge. And finally, another way forward is to recognize the inherent nature of cooperation in biological and social systems. We even, over the last couple centuries of science, we have inherited this view of, uh, of society being hum and hum humanity being uh, being, na being competitive, you know, nasty, brutish, and, sh and short in the famous line by Thomas Hobbes, also very, you know, Darwin, you know, also said that biological systems are competitive, this you know, survival of the fitness, so forth and so on, this, and that evolved into social Darwinism. However, in recent years, we've seen that there's been research to show that biological and social systems actually have cooperation baked in. There is an evolutionary advantage to Co cooperative behavior. And these conditions emerge uh, due to time, space, and networks. So there's a famous uh, experiment that was done uh, several decades ago at the University of Michigan on the iterated prisoner's dilemma. You may have heard of the prisoner's dilemma. This is where you have two prisoners, you separate them, and you say, if you give up information on, on, your, on your partner, we'll let you go free, but they'll go to jail. The outcome of that is that they both give up information on each other, so they both go to jail. In a famous series of uh, computational experiments, uh, political scientist Robert Axelrod showed that if you play the prisoner's dilemma over time and people have to live with their decisions over time, cooperation emerges naturally. So time creates cooperation. If we have to live with other people, we, we cooperate, we tend to cooperate more. What I'm showing on the screen here is an animation of a spatial prisoner's dilemma from evolutionary biology. That's a lattice there in that two dimensional world there. Every, every Every point in that lattice uh, is, plays basically plays a prisoner's dilemma with, with only with its neighbors. And what happens is that you know the blue islands there are islands of cooperation. The red shows uh, shows uh, uh, defection, in other words, non-cooperative behavior, and the green and yellow are switching back and forth. And what this shows is that the friction of distance and proximity naturally leads to islands of cooperation and an otherwise uh, competitive uh, um, domain. 
And finally, dynamic networks and group formation, many of which are fostered by information and communication technologies, can also lead to cooperative behavior. Doesn't mean that all these technologies, time, space, and these network technologies necessarily always lead to cooperative behavior, but there is an ability to basically push back against com competition and lead to natural groups, uh, natural form formation of groups that can cooperate together. So given all that, given the challenges I've just laid out at the beginning of the, uh, the talk and also these observations about wicked problems, complex systems, and post-normal science, I want to spend the next part of my talk about the paths forward. And I'm going to hit upon several things. One is that we need to respect the complexity. We need to treat cities as constantly emerging and contextual. Again, we need to embrace uncertainty and values through a post-normal science approach to, uh, to addressing wicked problems. We need to take an opportunistic approach to science, leverage real world events and experiments via ongoing observation and analysis. And we need to build environments for collaboration and knowledge co-production. So what I'm calling for is a novel observatory based urban sustainability science that treats the city as a complex system best understood one event at a time and treats sustainability as a crucial but conflicted societal challenge. Now observatory science has a long history. What observatory science is is ongoing data collection and analysis based on a favored view supported by technology and organizational processes. Why do we do observatory science? Uh, one is discovery to try to generate new and surprising hypotheses. The other is to understand dynamics and complex multi-scale systems. Another is monitoring and outreach, for example, volcano observatories, where there are volcanoes, there tends to be volcano observatories. And then if something happens, not only do we understand the process, but we can get people out of harm's way. But most importantly, we're ready when something happens, when an event happens, whether it's a natural event, some evolution in the urban system, or perhaps a more, a more disruptive event, such as a pandemic, the data collection, the apparatus, the analysis is in place. We're collecting data on an ongoing basis, and we, we're ready, and we can understand how that event, how that experiment, how that disruption changed the system to gain better knowledge about how the system evolves. Now, observatory science has mostly been seen in physical science. We, we have seen this in uh, human science as well. Uh, there's something called social observatories that dates back to the late 19th century. Patrick Geddes's Outlook Tower in Edinburgh is, the, is a very visible example of that. That building still exists along the Royal Mile in, uh, in um, Edinburgh. And the idea is a long-term study of social phenomena and since that time, it's traditionally focused on health. For example, there's a long-term uh, health study, such as the famous Framingham, Massachusetts uh, public health study, where they followed a cohort of nurses over decades to, to understand the impacts of their behaviors on, on health. Recently, we've seen scientists treating the World Wide Web as an info eco in information ecosystem and developed web observatories, which is middleware for broad data, the complex data from diverse web sources, and to see how this data evolves over time and in response to societal changes, and also how that, how that information changes society as well. And more recently, we've seen uh, the development of the concept of geographic information observatories, where we either observe geographic information itself because of we're interested in the, com the complexity of how geographic information evol evolves over time, or we use that geographic information as a lens to observe the world. So urban sustainability observatories build upon these ideas by doing ongoing production and engaging with urban data and knowledge in order to achieve deeper understanding of wicked problems embedded within complex urban systems. And ultimately, the idea is wise management shaping the cities towards more sustainable outcomes. Now, if you paid attention to this area, you probably say to me, well, Harv, come on, we already have first generation urban observatories. You know, there's things such as the Urban Big Data Center in Glasgow, Newcastle has the Obser Urban Observatory, uh, there's lots of examples, the, um, the Kinder Institute at Rice University in Houston has an urban data platform. 
So these things already exist, the idea of ongoing urban data collection and analysis. But what I'm calling for is a next generation urban observatory rooted in sustainable systems thinking and post-normal science. An urban sustainability observatory goes beyond current generation urban data observatories and cyber infrastructure to provide capabilities that are well suited for scientific discovery, experimentation, and evidence-based policy for complex systems where the goal sustainability is a wicked problem. It provides a platform for facilitating partnerships and new ways in which such partnerships can enable public engagement in ways that are practical, not only for advancing urban science, but also facilitating exchange of information and co-learning by researcher and community stakeholders, ultimately leading to better decision-making by local communities. In the next few slides, I'll talk about what I think are some of the features of a next generation urban sustainability urban observatory. One is integrated geospatial data and services. So we're talking about spatial, temporal, moving objects and streaming data. Ur using geography, it would be is a central organizing principle for the data interfaces via map-based visualizations and queries. The, the urban sustainability observatory would provide a com a common platform for otherwise fragmented and siloed databases on disparate systems. The data in the USO should be curated and ready to use. It should be clean, documented, co-registered, and related based on geo-referencing. This type of curation is likely to be a human-centric rather than machine-centric process, at least for the immediate future. So a USO would benefit from data, data concierge services for linking and organizing data, supporting analysis and mapping and visualization user-friendly interfaces and guided procedures that would draw from a knowledge base that can help guide these processes, similar to commercial GIS software. For more complicated processes that defy simple rules, the USO could provide could apply machine learning and AI methods to gain knowledge from other users' interaction. This could involve a rating or feedback system to assess processing and analytical outcomes. It's a difficult multi-dimensional task that could include users' subjective ratings. And uh, a big part of any observatory will be picking good indicators, indicators, you know, data indicators that are reflect the best science on urban sustainability, but also reflect local issues, interests, and policy levers, but at the same time allow comparability across cities at, uh, around the world, consistent with principles and with existing frameworks for measuring sustainability. We also need tools for opportunistic science, continuous open-ended data collection. This would, these would be always ready for planned interventions and unplanned disruptions. And what we need here are, are new forms of quasi and natural experimental designs and case control matching. What I'm showing on the slide here is a, a quasi experimental analysis we did for a new bus line in Columbus, Ohio, where we picked the stops along the new bus line and then we found comparable matches using similar land use and demographics for we found each 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 bus stop along the line of this new route we found a matching bus stop in the city that was very similar in terms of those characteristics land use and demographics and then we looked at whether or not this new bus line actually increased ridership while controlling for these other factors that were happening in the city uh, we need this is this is well established in in places like public in fields such as public health, social work, and other type of fields. This is meant to create a real world analog to randomized control trials, which are scientific gold standard for inferring causality. causality. Uh, when it comes to spatial data though, we need to uh, basic, we need a new form of um, quasi natural experimental designs and methods. We need ones that are scalable, can handle uh, can handle variations in data quality and missing data, can handle that are non-parametric, and also can handle things such as non-crisp boundaries, spatial dependency, and spatial heterogeneity. Another challenge is building knowledge beyond local events. So it's some of the tactical urbanism and other experimental approaches I mentioned, events and interventions are going to be local and provisional. However, network effects are large, especially when it comes to transportation. There's a difference between building one bus lane and an entire bus network or one bike lane and an entire bike lane network. So we have to figure out how we can transfer knowledge across geographical systems that we recognize are complex. 
Two possible approaches are using geospatial temporal and moving objects data imputation, and there's been a lot of advances of that in recent years. And also another approach would be simulation via, via digital twins and mirror worlds. I'll come back to the idea of mirror worlds in just another slide or two. And we also need to take a post-normal science approach and embrace uncertainty and heterogeneous values. We need to create knowledge co-production by lowering the friction and raising the value of community interactions via semi-automatic sto story generation based on scientific evidence, allowing people to give feedback on the validity of those stories and interrogate the evidence, and take a community machine teaming approach where we use technologies embedded within social systems and within communities in order to advance our knowledge. What I'm showing on the right side of the screen is a project we're working on here at Ohio State called the Public Engagement to Reimagine Community Co-Planning. We pronounce that PERC. We have one of the C's as being silent. And what we're showing there is a classic co-planning process which involves identifying problems, proposing solutions, creating planning scenarios, selecting the final plan, and then implementing and evaluating that plan. That's that's the common co-planning process. And we're showing how our platform, which is going to be an AI machine learning based platform, can allow translation between the community stakeholders and planners by allowing storytelling, scientific storytelling in both directions. People can tell stories about their lived experience, which that's translated into evidence for planners, and planners can develop stories that resonate with people based on the evidence they're seeing, both from what they're hearing from the community, but also based on more traditional forms of data and knowledge. And I mentioned just a couple slides ago, the idea of mirror worlds. And if you've heard me talk over the last decade or so, you've probably heard me mention this idea. I think it's one of the most underrated and under-recognized ideas. In, in the area of geographic information science. It was developed actually by computer scientist David Galerter, who's at Yale University. And what he what he what he and he developed he wrote this book in 1993. It was very prescient. And what he noticed is that we're going to have advances in virtual reality and augmented reality in the future. And also we're going to have streaming data into the future. And he thought we need to bring these together to create virtual realities that don't reflect alternative realities, but reflect the real reality. So a mirror world is a real-time, comprehensive, detailed, interactive, and discoverable digital portrayal of a complex real-world system. So it's an it's a it's a virtual reality that's tightly coupled to the real world, a tool for investigating and managing reality, helping managers, citizens, and users understand and manage real-world systems for collaborative and shared decision making. In this book, he looks at two levels. He looks at a modern hospital, which is a very complex system at a more local and architectural scale. And he also looks at cities and that cities have become so complex, they're very difficult to manage, especially in cooperation with the community. And he, he pushes forward the concept of mirror worlds to help create this collaborative and shared decision making at, at all geographical scales. Now, in recent years, there's been recognition that COVID and the movement towards things such as Zoom have really kind of rebooted our ability to interact with people. And I'm showing here an article that was published in November 2021. And this is published by five members of major private sector planning firms in the United States. And they look back at what happened over the last couple of years involving COVID and people going online, working from home, teaching, teaching online and said, let's take these lessons and let's reboot how how we how we engage the public in transportation planning. We should keep offering virtual sessions like this. We should keep bridging the digital divide through creativity and we should continue to share and shift power. We need to start le leveraging hybrid engagement, measuring the impact of this engagement, not just assuming its work, extending virtual engagement beyond a time restricted event and understanding that engagement moves at the speed of trust. We don't get engagement unless we work on trust and trust takes a long time. We should stop enabling check the box engagement like in the United States legally. Transportation planners are required to have public meetings whenever they have a new plan or intervention or proposal. They just basically go out into the public. They go out for a couple hours, invite people in. Then they say, OK, good, and they go back and, and, uh, and um, you know, uh, uh, implement one of the plans based on the feedback from the public. That tends to be kind of check the box like, OK, we did it. We had our meeting. Now we can move forward. 
We need to stop doing that. We need to stop using buzzwords to communicate or sell complex ideas and trust that people can understand things if they're conveyed in a proper way. And we need to use this technology to move beyond holding meetings at times and locations that only work for a small slice of the, slice of the population. We invited these five members of that wrote this manifesto to give a virtual talk at CARA, my center, Center for Urban Regional Analysis at Ohio State. I highly recommend watching this video, this panel discussion. If you go to cura.osu.edu slash past events slash 2022, you'll see the evolving community engagement panel discussion. It's well worth an hour of your time to really hear this discussion about how we can improve community engagement and knowledge co-production. So to wrap things up, I want to talk about some of the scientific challenges I see in, in taking this approach. One scientific challenge is how do we build tools and protocols for opportunistic, sustainable mobility science? How do we build knowledge in complex geographical systems? I talked about that earlier in the slide. We're, we're, we're looking at things that happen often on a local scale and often on a temporary basis. How do we extrapolate this to learn lessons about how to change our cities in a more comprehensive way? Excuse me. How do we achieve shared understanding given uncertainty and heterogeneous values? I've talked about post normal science and how scientific storytelling can be a way to exchange knowledge in both directions between the community and between professional planners. How do we resolve barriers to geographic knowledge co production? Mirror worlds, these type of technologies we're using right now, other types of um, of information communication technologies can work very well. They can take the time and space barriers around, not, uh, remove them from knowledge co-production. It doesn't mean that we don't go out into the community. It doesn't mean we try to bridge the digital and analog divide, but we use these technologies as a way of supplementing our, our classic interaction in more meaningful ways. And how do we make the system scalable, open, inclusive, and collaborative? The scientific merit is that this can generate new insights into the behavior of complex mobility, urban and other geographical systems. We can better understand interactions between the nature, between natural human built and social systems that drive sustainability across multiple scales, and also deeper understanding of how people interact with geographic data and information. But ultimately the broader impacts is that we can have a more sustainable urban planet, more appropriate and sensitive based evidence based policies that make progress towards a more sustainable world. So to conclude, sustainable mobility is challenging. It's complex, literally. It's wicked. It's a dilemma. Values and norms are integral, but the stakes are high. And what I'm proposing in this lecture is to leverage persistent data, treat mobility in cities as complex systems, don't ignore, but embrace uncertainty and embrace heterogeneous values and enable adaptive science and knowledge co-production. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanna say that it does take a village to do these things. And this is uh, my team at Ohio State. We're across multiple disciplines in college, including public health, geography, uh, Huen Lane Geography, You'll, she'll be speaking later in this uh, in this lecture series. Computer Science, Integrated Systems Engineering. So we have a multidisciplinary team working on our version of this, um, this type of approach. And we're also working with some great community partners, the City of Columbus and the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, which is our local federally mandated metropolitan planning organization. And if you're interested in following up on some of these ideas, there are several papers you can, you can you can look at. In particular, that paper at the top that was published in Harvard Data Science Review, we had a, a National Science Foundation sponsored workshop a couple years ago on this topic of urban sustainability observatories, and we were invited to write a uh, concept paper in Harvard Data Science Review. And a lot of the ideas I just discussed in this, in this lecture are, are in that paper. Okay, thank you very much. And I believe we have a little bit of time for questions, and I'd be happy to entertain them. Yes, thank you, uh, Harvey, for this very fascinating and uh, thought-provocative uh, talk, which raises, raises important questions, but uh, offers so many paths forward as well uh, in, in diverse uh, geographic settings, I would say. So first, um, to let our online audience know, we also have the possibility to use this question and answer session, uh, uh, section in our 
uh, in our Teams talk, uh, which would, should be available for you via this online setting. Uh, and we, can, we have also um, an audience here. Uh, so first I would give the word to the local audience if you have any questions here. Yes, please, Elias Gilbeck. Yes, uh, indeed, I'm Elias from the University of Helsinki and thank you for the extremely interesting lecture. And I would have several questions, but I, I just to ask one. So I was wondering uh, in regard to the mirror, mirror words uh, that you were presenting, and I, I felt like they are quite close perhaps to digital twins that are also quite often discussed. So how do you see we can facilitate the integration of, of things that are unmeasurable, like values and evidence from post-normal science type of experiments? Because often I think that these remain uh, measuring things that can be measured. So how, how do you think we can facilitate going beyond uh, beyond that and, and also integrate data and understanding from unmeasurable things? Right. Excellent question. And that is something we have to guard against. You know, uh, we can't just like measure the things that are measurable because we know in, in human nature, the things we measure are the things we get. And we also know that everything that's measurable is not important and things that are important are not necessarily measurable. This is why I've really embraced this idea of post-normal science, the idea of, of centering scientific storytelling, which means being able to capture lived experiences and perspectives, but in a principled way that we can translate that into evidence. And also we can translate evidence into these type of um, you know, stories about experiences. I'm, I'm really embracing that approach uh, as a way of capturing some of this, some, some of these things that we can't necessarily capture from uh, traditional sources of data. Uh, the other thing I would say is also that we're seeing advances in, um, you know, qualitative data and especially using machine learning and AI approaches to understand qualitative data. Uh, you know, uh, one thing I think is very powerful is, is something that called the story map, and that's a product, you know, from Esri, you know, ArcGIS, the idea that we can embed stories and multimedia within maps in order to convey stories and, you know, in a spatial way. But I think that we're still in a first generation of story maps. I think what we need is, a, is also a next generation of story maps. And what I mean by there is that we, we have to, we have to come up with methods that allow us to perform spatial analysis, not only on quantitative spatial data, but also qualitative spatial data, things like this video, stories, narratives, archival uh, histories. And when we, if we can achieve that where quantitative and qualitative data are on an equal footing when it comes to spatial analysis and spatial reasoning, I think then we can break down some of the barrier that, you, that you're describing. But more generally, it's this idea of human machine teaming. One of the people I'm working with on this project is a guy named Mike Rayo at Ohio State, and that's what he works on. He works on human machine teaming. And his idea is that you have to have humans in the loop, not only to produce knowledge and produce you know, uh, information and knowledge, but also to be a check on the information and knowledge that you're generating through, through other methods. I hope that answers your question. It's it's a very good one, and it's something that we really have to have to guard against, and that we we have to work actively towards. Thank you. It was really interesting to hear. Yes, and, and thank you. Um, I would like to continue, perhaps in the in the same lines uh, or similar lines. Uh, this urban observatory approach, uh, by default, as said, it, it captures this kind of normative data. What are the flows of people? What is the environmental state? Uh, where, which areas are polluted, uh, affected by the heat, uh, flooded, etc.? If we talk about these kind of uh, environmental uh, issues, and, and uh, which are really also, um, or, or we are facing the threat in the future even more. But also, this kind of automatically collected data very often dismisses people and the communities, and, or, or who are those people who get affected, uh, or, or who are those people who receive most of the benefits. So, and there is also the, the strong privacy concerns. So, we do not want right. to track people and, and their identities to also understand like who is represented in the data, who is not, 
who gets affected, who gets the benefits. So how does your approach uh, involve or include social communities uh, and, and people from that respect on a broader population scale? Right, that's that's a subject of our current research and that and that path platform I talked about, PERC, we're actually working with a local neighborhood here in Columbus called the Near East Side, which is an area that's been uh, underinvested and deprived for 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 many years. It was subject to redlining, if you know what that is. That was a, a approach that was developed in the early 20th century where banks would indicate you know, which neighborhoods should receive mortgages and uh, loans for housing and na neighborhoods that were predominantly uh, filled with black people and pe people of color were redlined, meaning they didn't get mortgages, they didn't get the, the privilege of home ownership. Also urban highway construction. So we're picking in, in our, in our um, project, we've picked really a neighborhood where, which has really suffered over the last few decades, really since the early 20th century. Um, really, really, really been deprived, and um, we're, we're we we chose this we chose this neighborhood because we wanted to have a, a to exactly address this issue, is that we didn't want to go to like an affluent neighborhood where people would be amenable to this, but we wanted to try to see whether or not we could use this approach, and do it in a way that we can build trust and build you know build trust in the system so we're taking a co-design approach we're not just trying to develop a platform for doing co-planning we're actually taking a co-design approach to develop the platform so that we we make sure that what we're doing is sensitive and people feel included and empowered and feel like their voices are being heard so it it is a very challenging problem uh you know uh they've heard <laughs> you know th these neighborhoods are used to hearing having um you know, Professor drop in from the university and say, hey, we're here to solve your problems, do some research, never hear from them again. We've been, we're taking a long view, and this is a multi-year project where we're first working at building, building trust so people realize that we're going to listen to them and listen to their needs. And then as then we'll, we'll co-design this platform and try to move to uh, to an outcome where people are the neighborhood are true partners in, in this endeavor, not just the subjects of our of our research. Thank you. Uh, and we take the last question uh, before the end of the uh, uh, the talk today. It's Ralph Bromqvist from Finland, uh, and he asks, how would you assess the impacts on mobilities of hybrid or remote work and the emergence of multi-local lifestyles now emerging post-COVID across the Nordics? Is this a game changer or just a momentous shift? Oh, that's hard to say. That's a, Like I said, these are complex systems, and the only way to really determine it is to what to watch it evolve, <laughs> in to a large degree. Um, it's a really good question. Uh, I think that our like our city centers are going to change. I think our downtowns, our central business districts are going to change. In some ways, they're going to go back to the way they were before. So before the before the 19th century. Downtowns used to be multi-dimensional places where a lot of things happen. People live, people work, people shop, people produce things. In the 19th century, with the invention of the telegraph, the railroad, skyscrapers, and things like that, downtowns became concentrations of office buildings. That may go away now because people can work from home. They have more flexibility. They may not be going to a central place to to do uh, you know knowledge type work. So in a sense, downtowns may go back to what they were before the 19th century, and they and they they thrive for thousands of years before the 19th century. So we actually, I, my prediction is that we'll see we'll see we'll be going back to the way um, cities used to be before industrialization to some degree. But that's just a prediction. Check on me in a couple of years and see whether or not you you, uh, you agree <laughs> with that. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, and now as the last word, final word, uh, I would like to give the word. Uh, to Troy Robinson uh, from the State Department, State Department from the United States. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Troy Robinson. I work for the U.S. Speaker Program at the U.S. Department of State. Um, I just wanted to convey some apologies that our uh, colleagues at the embassy in Tallinn would uh, would have liked to join, but there were some technical issues on their end. And so I, I have uh, been tapped to convey a, a message of thanks from the embassy. Uh, the U.S. Embassy was very happy to work with the U.S. Speaker Program in bringing Dr. Miller's expertise to Estonia. 
We want to thank the University of Tartu and the Mobility Lab for putting this event together. A very big thanks, of course, to Dr. Miller. It was an incredibly interesting lecture. I thought the mirror world uh, topic in particular was really fascinating. Um, we're very grateful for your time and willingness to share your knowledge and experience with us today. We hope everyone that logged on found it informative and can take something away as we all work to further sustainable efforts in both the United States and over there in Estonia. So thank you all so much. Well, th thank you. Thank you, Troy. And, and we, we are really grateful for uh, both Professor Harvey Miller for his time and effort in the putting together this fantastic uh, presentation and for all the support and cooper cooperation from the US uh, Embassy in Estonia uh, side. So thank you for the contributions, your time, your efforts and all the audience here, as well as online audience for attending our talk today. So we close our session for today. Thank you. We'll meet next uh, week within the series with a new lecture. Bye bye. Thank you.